Welcome everybody, I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions, where we have a mission to change the world one brave word at a time. And today, to help me do that, I have some of the authors of an amazing new book coming up called Sacred Medicine, Mystical Practices for Ecstatic Living. They are here with me to celebrate and talk about this amazing book. First, I'd love to thank our lead author, Jen Pisano. Jen, thank you so much for your mission and your vision for this book. Uh, we would not be here without you. And I love how these authors are giving you their kisses and their waves. <laughs> that is awesome. Hi, ladies. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hey. Good morning. So listeners, with me here today, I have Erica Delani. She's a somatic sex and magic coach who helps people fuel the life of their dreams with the energy of their authentic desire. I also have Ashura Allen. She's a master healer, spiritual counselor, and acupuncturist, helping people to live their most radiantly healthy, soul-aligned life. Lulu Travina, quantum healer, soulful living coach, shifting the societal narrative about women and age is with me. And lastly, Chelsea, Chelsea Lee Woodstra, light bringer, body worker, artist of love and style. I like that combination. I'm so happy to have all of you here. I'm going to say thank you first off. Thanks for saying yes to this. Thank you for playing in the sandbox of sacred medicine with us. And thank you for just being here and shining your light today. Uh, I want to start with Erica. Erica, talk to us about this beautiful chapter that you wrote. Thanks, Laura. So I wrote chapter 19, light your fire, ecstatic embodiment to fuel your dreams. The story that I share in that chapter goes back to when I was in graduate school. I was taking classes, teaching classes, working a second job editing for the university press, raising two toddlers. Um, my husband wasn't around very much because he was focused on starting an independent record label at the time. Um, and life just felt overwhelming and isolated, like it was a giant to-do list that would never, ever end. Um, and... I was really overwhelmed by all of that and moving from thing to thing. And I connect with so many women who identify with that. Um, and so the practice that I share in my chapter is a visualization uh, that helps anchor pleasurable sensations in nature to access your own erotic energy. Uh, it's ex especially useful when you're falling asleep and moving into a dream state, because that helps connect that power of felt sensation and embodiment and pleasure to those everyday sensations. Um, the visualization connects with the sensation of sun on your skin, the taste of salt, the sound of flowing water. And these things come up for us over and over in our day-to-day -day life. So we can have those feelings of relaxation and pleasure throughout our days. That mind-body connection is a really powerful tool to increase energy, passion, and joy. And this really helps reconnect with yourself and the ones you love. So how did you get to doing this kind of work in the world? What, tell us a little part of that story. Yeah, um, well, I... Um, <laughs> When I was 18 and moved out of my parents' uh, house, I really went looking for a spiritual path that connected my feminine self and my body and sexuality with the divine. And first, I really started trying to make that up for myself and then actually connected with an essay by Margaret Atwood um, that talked about witchcraft and witches as female poets, women who use words powerfully to create change and who might be ostracized from society because of it. Uh, and that really resonated for me. And that set me down this pathway toward these twin ideas of sacredness and sexuality and how those things connect through nature. 
I had a coach once uh, who was in a, this, a similar field and long ago I was separating pieces. And what she basically said to me was your sexuality and sensuality is your creativity. These are so connected that if you are not having one, you are not having the other. What would you say about that? Absolutely. This is absolutely true. And that's one of the things that excites me about this tool is that it really helps uh, rekindle that spark of creativity and passion by by rekindling that spark of erotic energy that we all carry within us. And it doesn't have to be a partnered situation. That's one of the beauties of this particular tool is that it really is all about your connection to your own vital source of energy. I was uh, talking to someone yesterday um, a little bit about this topic, but the conversation was kind of like, well, if you're not getting it from the person that you'd like to get it from, then you just got to give it to yourself. That is absolutely <laughs> true. Well, you know, it kind of goes back to the thing they say about putting on your own oxygen mask first, right? We have to nourish ourselves so that we can do everything else we want to be able to do in life, to show up for ourselves before we can show up for anybody else. And this energy source is really essential to making that happen. Well, I thank you, Erica. I cannot wait for you guys to read Erica's chapter. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Laura. Ashra, you are up next. Tell us about your amazing chapter. Hi, everybody. I am chapter seven, and it's entitled Crystal Rose Ray Healing, Karmic Clearing to End Self-Sabotage and Live in Your Power. Uh-oh. Did she freeze or did I freeze? <laughs> Asher froze. Are you back yet? Oh my goodness. I'm glad at least it wasn't me, right? This is the beauty of the group Zoom calls. All right, Asher, we we have you frozen in audio and video. Oh, are you back? Nope, not yet. Okay. Let's go to Lulu next and I'm going to circle back around to Asher for uh, for her answer. Lulu, talk to me about your beautiful chapter. Yeah, hi Laura, hi ladies. And hi, uh, viewers. Uh, my chapter is called Daring to Date the Divine. It's about conscious daily blessings. And um, I, I talk a little bit about having some spiritual experiences from a young age and then really having a very embodied um, experience that took me as if to another lifetime or another um, part of the whole collective uh, mystery. So I speak about that and um, I then give some very simple tools that anyone could pick up and, and uh, use in their daily life. And I think there's about 10 in the, in the uh, tool section. So no one can change anything for you, only you can change something for yourself. So it, it just takes one step towards something to create change and then you take you can take those small steps and then you can create change in another area so that's why I chose to do the um the conscious daily blessings as ways to bring that sacredness into your life bring that sense of fascination wonder delight um I, I was really interested in what Erica said and she was talking about you know the sacred the creative the creative essence etc and you know, I've been exploring the erotic innocence and, you know, like erotic and innocent, it's like two different polarities, but when you get them closer together, it's, it's that full sense of awe that we did have when we were young, that we could, you know, be so delighted by things we would see or feel or, you know, experience like every day we could look at a flower and it would still be beautiful, you know? So um, that's where my tools are to create that fascination, wonder and awe and live very simply in by just taking small steps. Lulu, um, obviously you worked towards these kinds of practices and there might have been a moment or many where you realized you, you weren't practicing like you wanted to practice. And what I want to share with the readers about this is um, what Lulu is talking about, just simple phrases, simple words, simple affirmations. These all start as thoughts, and then we bring them out 
in, you know, with our voice, right? So it can be really simple is my point, Lulu. Yeah, that, and that's true. And, you know, like I, I have days where I'm, you know, spinning my own wheel and then I'm like, oh, I could actually sh shift that a little bit. So we all have those days as well. Um, we, you know, we're also carrying programming in our life and it does take a while for the unraveling of that. We can't just think, think one positive affirmation and life is going to be, you know, completely different. That's a very bypassing way of thinking. Um, but yeah, definitely having good support with people, trusting your own body, embodying, you know, your own thoughts and feelings and, um, you know, moving in the direction that you so choose that um, makes you feel a lot more vi vitality and um, aliveness. I loved, um, I smiled as I read your first opening scene because I was immediately uh, smelling things and seeing really vibrant colors. Um, and I love that about your writing. And I know that you do that kind of writing in your poetry and your chapters and everything else. Like, so talk to me a little bit about that writing and how it's evolved for you. I must say that, you know, Jen, the lead author, she she was talking to me about my chapter and she's like, from the first chapter with, that we were in the same book together to now, she's like, wow. So, you know, writing is a journey as well. We're always evolving in our voice. We're evolving in, um, you know, both our vulnerability and our courage of what we're prepared to stand in. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like the sensations and the kinesthetic feeling for the the reader um and you know i do, do talk about indian you know smells and colors and then last year when i went to india and i was like immersed in that it was like ah oh, it was like oh this beautiful cloak just hugged me and embraced me so yeah i like to uh have the reader feel it for themselves as well as you know me tell it so it's true for me well, you do that really well. Thank you. <laughs> Ashura, we're glad you're back. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go back to you and ask you about this beautiful chapter that you wrote. Great. So once again, um, it's chapter seven, Crystal Rosary Healing. Um, and it's about ending karmic patterning so that we can live in our power and end self-sabotage. And I wrote this story about my relationship with my friend Anahita, who was a metastatic stage four breast cancer survivor, 10 years past what doctors said was possible. And that was due in part to this channeling of this healing lineage that she passed forward to me. And on her deathbed, I promised I would continue her work. So I'm really honored to be passing forward this lineage. It's absolutely beautiful. And the tool that I share with you is once again, this tool to clear those karmic patterns that might continue to show up in this lifetime that may or may not be rooted in other lifetimes and just ways to get out of our own way. And it's a beautiful chance for me to just continue her work. Ashra, give us an example of something that's showing up in our lives that, that might give us a clue that this kind of work needs to be done. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. So let's say you have relationships and they always seem to have the same core issues in them and it's just on like groundhog day it keeps just repeating itself and you'll think what the heck i did that work and here it is again and so that's one example where we can have karmic patterns that show up we may also see karmic patterns that we had with our parents showing up in relationships patterns with money that just we can't seem to move past and so that's what this tool is designed to help you bust through so what's your personal story behind this? Like, how did you get to doing this kind of work? Uh-oh. Oh, are you there? Yeah, so <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, I am. Can you, can, can you hear me? Here we got you. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I came to this work because Anahita was a healer in the same place I was a healer. And when she saw me, she just laid her hands on me and said, I, I need to do this healing work on you. And so I experienced her healing work firsthand and, and just loved it. And so that's what drew me in. And I had never felt anything like that in my life and later contacted her and said, I need to learn this, whatever this is. 
And she and I became really good friends and it just snowballed from there. And it was beautiful to watch her lineage just really take form and shape and then get passed on to students. I have students and it's, it just feels like a beautiful stream that she channeled. So my experience was directly receiving that healing from her. Uh, thank you. Um, you guys wait until you read this chapter and really all of your chapters. And we'll talk to Chelsea about hers in just a second, but I'll, I, you know, to be, y'all are master teachers. And so with your clients in front of you doing the coaching and doing the guiding, this is something you guys do all day long, but to actually get it in words in a book in the way that the reader can have an experience. This was a mission of mine with these books and you all are amazing. You did this in such powerful ways. And it's one of the reasons I get excited about sharing your messages and these books because they are changing people's lives. Um, Chelsea, please tell us about your beautiful chapter. All right, Laura, thank you. Um, gosh, it's so cool to just hear everybody's stuff too. It's so fun. But so my chapter is about um, losing my temper with my daughter, actually, which felt really terrifying to put out there. So um, I, I wanted people to know that it's normal to have those moments. So the chapter is overall more about learning to have compassion with yourself when you fuck up because we all do, whether it's losing your temper with anyone or yourself or all of those shame stories we have that we pile on ourselves when we make a mistake. And so the chapter is mirror, mirror, and it's the tool is about mirror work, which I feel like really beautifully connects to what the other women have talked about with affirmations and also being present with what you're feeling um, because that's critical. We can't bypass with affirmation, but when we look in the mirror and we truly allow ourselves to see ourselves and see our pain and our beauty simultaneously, and then fill that space of, wow, I've, I'm human, I'm human, but I'm still worthy and finding ways to make that into daily practice. And like Lulu said, you know, consciously blessing every moment and every experience. And Erica's talking about that too, of making every sensation pleasurable um, and tying it into our daily life. I feel like that's so critical. And so that's something I wanted to speak to and, and give people that reminder that you can mess up and you can mess up a lot and there still is coming back from that. And you're still worthy even when you make mistakes. So that's a big piece of what my chapter is about. So I read your scene and I was immediately just struck in the heart with, holy crap, that girl is brave to write that. And what I wanna ask you now is, did have you written about that before? Was this, okay. How, so talk to me about how that was for you, because I thought that was a brave, um, it was brave to write about that particular kind of anger. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, thank it. you. Yeah, that's kind of like the reaction that all my friends who either know what it's about or have helped me edit were like, wow, that's really brave. Um, yeah, that's, it was terrifying. So initially, I actually wrote a whole different chapter that was about like, COVID and difficulties, but everyone's had that. And that was kind of too easy. And then I woke up in the middle of the night and this kind of just came through. And it was about five years ago too. So it's something I'm, I'm past and have worked through. Um, but you know, it continues to come up. I'm parenting a 10 year old. We're parenting kids or dealing in deep relationships and people trigger us and we trigger ourselves. And so, yeah, it was terrifying to talk about that. And no, I had not written it before. And I also also did read it to my daughter before I submitted because I wanted to make sure she was comfortable with it and one thing that was really fascinating was she goes oh wow it's wild to hear it from your perspective and I'm like oh baby like you're so sweet to she's like wow she goes I'm sorry I'm like no 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 <laughs> you're not you have nothing to be sorry for but that she and I have this um, really open relationship and that she has that level of compassion and understanding for even someone who can be like the villain. 
I think is really a beautiful testament to just who she is naturally. But, you know, that work that we've done to say, like, this behavior happens, this isn't okay, but I'm sorry. And like teaching your kids to apologize when they're wrong and that we make those mistakes too. So definitely. Um, well, thank you for writing about it. And, um, you know, whether you're a mom in the very traditional sense or other senses, we are writing stories and teaching tools that model for our children. And the healing goes in both directions. It goes toward the children direction. It goes towards our parents direction. This is multi-generational, the work, I'll call it work for now. We do, you know, in our moments. And I'm so, oh my goodness, I'm so honored to play in this sandbox with badasses who are showing up and taking responsibility for their own awareness practice. And so every time I read one of your chapters, I'm like, yes, you know, I found them. I found my people. This is, this is world changing stuff. So thank you all for being part of that. Um, Lulu, I'm going to start with you for this next one. You ready? <laughs> ready. Okay. So this, this question is coming around to all of you. And this, this long version of the question, I'll say to Lulu, and I'll make it shorter for the rest of you. But, you know, in the subtitle of this book is ecstatic living not just like any kind of living, all right? We picked this word on purpose, speaking of purposefully chosen words. Um, there was a point when my knowing there was more to life was screaming inside me, okay? I hadn't been listening to the whispers. So my body began to shout louder. And I believe that some of us, us have gotten really good at this suffering thing. And it's time to understand what's possible in terms of joy and ecstasy, those crazy, juicy words, right? So Lulu, what do you want to share about this? It's a very open-ended question, but yeah, ecstatic. A lot of people don't realize how there is a ecstatic bliss in just breathing like when we really pause with presence and feel into our body and feel that breath we can be in rapture and we have been told otherwise we have to seek something outside to feel that so your body is a beautiful piece of intelligence and we can find these places of awe, wonder, fascination, rapture, ecstatic, uh, bliss, et cetera, within ourselves. Um, when did I find this in my life? I don't know. I, I want to say there was some reminder already in my DNA when I was born. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. And it was just keep following that feeling. F follow what feels known. So that's why I do the work I do. I do the healing I do. I, you know, support people. And, you know, even in my parenting and being a home birth um, mum, et cetera, I was looking for the deepest expression of self in body. So, and that's where I feel we find ecstatic in our body. Yes. I love this topic so much. We need to have like a whole podcast just on this topic, right? All right. Um, and that's why I love the book so much too. And we talked about the title and we talked about the words and how we were going to, you know, put that out there. Um, Erica, I know this topic is up your alley too. So um, how would you talk about this? You know, we've got the knowing that there's more mm. and we've been taught to kind of be okay with content. Mm. At least that was my experience. So what do you want to say about this? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. So what I was thinking about while Lulu was talking, especially is um, that the importance of anchoring in the body, but one of the things that has been really powerful for me is understanding my body as part of nature and how connecting with the natural world is also a, an enormous uh, resource toward healing and ecstasy and bliss. 
I remember being a child and talking to the trees in my yard um, and really just having that. And even now walking down the street, I think Lulu mentioned this too, the, that awe of seeing a flower and um, how beautiful they are and the fragrance of each one. And when people go on walks with me, they know if I vanish, it's because I'm off taking pictures of more and more flowers. Um, and my phone is full of them. Um, because there is this constant source of um, beauty and connection and ecstasy all around us. Um, if we can reach out and connect with that and give ourselves that kind of resonance within ourselves and remember that we are just another flower on the planet, each one of us. And our bodies are that same kind of blossom and honor ourselves as that beautiful emanation that we see all around us. Um, so I think that's probably what I would, how I would respond to that. Yeah. How did you know I have a phone full of flower pictures too? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, yes. yeah. It's, um, it's such a, it's a, such a fast and sure connection for me for that feeling that also, and, and I know a lot of you resonate too, for my writing, for my poetry, mm -hmm. for the, the, you know, the beautiful words that come through. Um, so Chelsea, what do you want to add about this, uh, about ecstasy and living that life? Oh my gosh. So there's two things that I would say, and one is really just building on what Lulu and Erica said of that it's within us and all around us. And I think it's all about utilizing all of our senses, right? We get to enjoy a flower because it smells great and it's beautiful and it's soft. And I think sometimes we get so in our head that we forget to enjoy all the parts of something. And so I really love when people can like plug back into every level of their senses and even like on a walk, listen to the wind, listen to the trees talking to each other, listen to the birds. It's all those different senses combining that bring that like reminder that it's within you that, oh yeah, I'm part of this because I can feel it on every level of my body and being. So I really love that. And it definitely helps us anchor into our body and be expanded at the same time, which is ongoing work. And it's so easy to do in nature. Um, and then also, like you guys said way earlier about self-pleasure, like if you're not getting it somewhere else, I feel like that is a beautiful piece, finding those moments to enjoy your body, enjoy yourself, touch yourself, feel yourself, dance in front of a mirror, you know, enjoy being in a body because it's, it is a joy. It is ecstatic. Dancing, singing, shouting, crying, all of it is this really vibrant experience. And we, we are here and we get to do it. So I just encourage more and more of that. We get really refined and stopped in our back. So okay, explore. Let me, let me play devil's advocate with you. Yes. Chelsea, my body hurts. Yeah. How, tell me how I get to play and enjoy being in my body when I'm in chronic pain. Give me yes. an idea. Oh, that's a good one. So um, a big piece of that is starting to listen to what your pain is trying to tell you, because it's such a natural thing for us to want to like shut down, ignore, move, shift through our pain so fast. We, we act like it's a negative thing when usually when our body is in chronic pain or even acute pain, that is a message from your body that something has to shift be that diet, exercise, rest, more water, or maybe it's metaphysical, you know, maybe there's, you're not getting enough support, or you're not giving yourself enough pleasure or enough joy. But um, Layla Martin has this beautiful practice that's like a tantric practice where she teaches you to fully embody your pain. And I one time did this practice, and I had this horrible migraine. And I don't always get like a really emotional release with things, but I sat there and did this like breath and awareness practice and I started sobbing. And usually a migraine lasts for me for at least a couple of hours and it dissipated like that. 
because I listen. Lovely example. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I know that every single one of you has an answer to what I just asked Chelsea, because that, I mean, seriously, that could be its own podcast too, that one topic, how you shift when you've gotten yourself so deep into that. So uh, hold on that a moment. Ashura, I want you to answer the same question about ecstasy and that kind of life. Sure. Well, I think every spiritual lineage that I'm a holder of is all about ecstasy and embodiment. So I love hearing that here. And I would just submit that many of us through our cultural upbringing or our religious upbringing, we're often given a schism where we were taught that this Skin, that the flesh is inherently sinful and bad and nothing could really be farther from the truth and in fact that's probably one of the greatest fallacies any of us were ever handed and so I actually see it as an act of revolution for us to dive into the bliss of our bodies you know especially I think as women in particular um, we were often told you know if, if we think about something like childbirth as a doula we're taught pain is just inherent part of giving birth. And certainly it's intense and yes, it can be painful. But I also teach my clients that and patients that birth can actually have moments of ecstasy, you know? And we, we tend to, again, sort of put these things into the realm of impossibility, but in fact, they're not. And so I had a spiritual teacher who once said to me, how good can you stand it? <laughs> I love that. that really strong. <laughs> How often do we ask ourselves that question? We self-limit a lot around our bliss potential. And so I always have her voice in the back of my head. How good can I stand it today? How good can I stand it in this moment? And just keep increasing our capacity for bliss. In Sanatana Dharma Hinduism, we have Sat Chit Ananda, soul consciousness, bliss. And Ananda bliss is understood to actually be our birthright and our natural inherent way of being. It's quite an, an anathema compared to sort of the fear factory and all the negativity and suffering that we're given and programmed with in this world. So really start to live into that. What if my natural state of being is actually one of bliss? And it's a very different organizing principle to live by. Holy moly, yes. I hope you're all feeling this with me, the power of the conversation we're having today, the, the game changer that some of these ideas are, and they're as close to you as understanding there's another way to think about things. There's another way to feel things. How good can you stand it? I'm writing that one down, slapping it on my computer so I can stare at that every day. Also, I'm just, I was writing earlier, I see it as an act of revolution to dive into the bliss of our bodies. That one's going to show up on a meme soon, Ashura. Thank you for that. Um, those, that's so beautiful. Um, okay, so I'm going to come around to all of you on this one. Chelsea, you're going to lead us off. So Sacred Medicine, the title of our book yeah, we put medicine on the title of our book, but why sacred? Mm, okay, yeah. So because it's inherent, it's part of us, it's not something that we have to go to the doctor and be prescribed. It is been handed down. It's been shared throughout time. It is available to all. And it is all about that inner and expansive connection. So I believe that is sacred. It's about the sacredness of the planet, the sacredness of yourself, your highest self, and the sacredness of being here now, transforming the life you have into the life of your dreams and making you your best self. So I think it's about that. <laughs> Only that. <laughs> yeah, just, just a little. No. And oh so my much. gosh. Yes, exactly. This is a big question, you guys. And, yeah. the, and the authors are probably like, oh my gosh, really? You're going to ask me that? Like, yeah. how can yeah. I answer this in, you know, a minute? It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. Thank you, Chelsea, for giving me that beautiful answer. I try. <laughs> um, 
Lulu, let's give you a shot at this. So, and I'll ask it a little differently too. So you guys can think about this differently, but you know, sacred medicine, you all are offering mind, body, soul, other life, environment, relation, like we run the gamut because I know that the books for me were a way to give lots of different people hope. There are many, many people in the world. They all need to hear it in a different way. And we've got all of these different kinds of sacred medicine in this, in this book, right? So when we think of medicine though, we think of something being prescribed, like Chelsea said, or something being given to us or something being told to us, like this is the way you need to do it. You know, so Lulu for you, um, why sacred medicine? Just talk to me about that a little bit. So I was going to say ditto for Chelsea. Just you know, <laughs> I know I knew you guys were going to do that. <laughs> it's hard going uh, after number one. I know. And, and then I thought of the scene in when Harry met Sally, and she's saying about eating the salad. <laughs> <laughs> the orgasm. Really, I'm not, yep, that one. Um, I think so. Sacred of the highest. That, that comes to mind for me, you know, having some sort of reverence of outside of the mundane. And the mundane still can be quite reverent. So sacred, that which feels sacred to us. And medicine, you know, medicine means healing to me. What You know, there's many allopathic or contemporary medicines or um, alternative medicines. They all are aiming us towards the direction of healing. So I think we're seeking that sacred healing, that reverent healing, that embodied healing, um, so that we feel a greater expansion of ourself. I love that. Beautiful. Yeah, so don't always um, get to have these kinds of conversations. And if you were brought up in a world where you were taken, you know, something's wrong with you, well, either brush it off, you're fine, or <laughs> we're going to take you to the person who's going to tell you what you need. And it, oh my goodness, those are limited options, right? Um, thank you, Lulu. Ashra, how would you talk about this sacred medicine? So what distinguishes sacred medicine from any other type of medicine for me is that it has spirituality at its core. And so we have to understand as spiritual beings having a physical experience that by the time something lands in the physical, it's already gone through the spiritual, the mental, emotional, the energetic by the time it's showing on the physical. So as someone who is 21 years in the healing arts industry as a private practitioner, what I've learned is that basically everything has a spiritual root. And if we go to the root, we really nix the problem. And so most of us don't, you know, when we go to see the doctor, we're not gonna talk about our spirituality. We're not gonna talk about the root of illness having anything to do with our spirituality whatsoever. And I just think that that's something that has really drawn me to really emphasizing that as a necessity when we go for any type of medicine is to remember our, our divinity and our spiritual nature. You're hitting on something that's really important. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just kind of follow up with a little, I'm gonna do the devil's advocate thing again. So if it's showing up in a physical form and that manifestation is well beyond the other stuff that came before it, how can I get better at, you know, feeling that stuff so I don't have to get to this physical manifestation part? It's such a great question. For me, it requires a daily practice. I just think that we all need a daily practice of connecting with spirit in any way that we find and connect with spirit. It really doesn't matter what that is. It can be your high self. It can be a tree. It can be God, God is beloved spirit. It doesn't matter but a source that gives you a sense of something beyond the mundane, beyond strictly just the sensorial world and connects you to that ethereal place where you have a sense that there's something greater, something bigger, something that is really anchoring you inside of your body that is not your body. So developing a daily practice, and that can just be getting quiet, getting still, most of us have what we call gateways that will open us into the divine. 
And it can be through the sensorial world. It can be through just getting still and quiet. It can be dancing. It can be having sex. It can be nourishing our family. But whatever gives us that sense of the divine, which is often also linked to service. So when we're in service to something that's a little bit bigger than we are, we're really touching the sacred. So speaking of having sex, Erica and I couldn't help myself. Tell me how you would think about this sacred medicine. And let me just say really quickly that um, when Ashura was talking about all of those different ways, this is essentially what we're offering in the book is these kinds of practices. So each of these beautiful author, expert, master healer teachers has given you a taste of the practices they actually use to get to these places that we're talking about today. It's brilliant, y'all. You're amazing. So um, Erica, talk to me about the sacred and sacred medicine. So obviously I completely agree with all the things that Lulu and Chelsea and Ashura have said. Um, and one of the things that kind of was coming up for me as I was listening is the idea is an, an echo from my childhood uh, and Mary Poppins and the notion that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? We think of medicine as being this bitter something um, and something that also in lots of contexts, we're concerned about side effects and all of that sort of baggage. And so for me, the sacred and sacred medicine um, helps, uh, is kind of that spoonful of sugar in many ways. It is um, the, the antithesis of that bitterness and those side effects are actually bliss. Um, and so when we are creating sacred medicine, we are tapping into the, to heal those spirit places that then can be reflected in those physical experiences as well. But um, just thinking about how um, every part of our physical experience, sex, being in nature, connecting with each other, connecting with ourselves, connecting with the divine, everything about being incarnate on this planet really is a sacred experience. And the kind of healing that we need, whether it's individually or much larger environmental healing, all of these things really are a quest to connect with what's sacred um, in day-to-day -day life. I love that. Beautiful. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that Mary Poppins scene in a really long time. <laughs> um, and it also gives me a flash to being handed the spoon with the gross stuff on it that made me gag and spit it out every time. And oh my goodness. What if the response could be bliss? What a question. What if the response could be the opposite? Um, okay, ladies, here comes one more question for all of you. We're gonna do the speed dating version of this. So we've been talking a lot about bliss and ecstasy, but this recording and, and book and podcast come in a time where people are really suffering. There has been a lot of the opposite kinds of feelings this past year, year and a half, almost two now. So um, Ashra, I'm going to have you start us off. What's one thing you want to share with our listeners if that's where they're still a little stuck? Yeah, thank you, Laura. I think that a quote is coming to mind that Catherine Hepburn said, and she had a daily ritual of plunging herself into the ocean, I believe in Maine. So we're talking super cold. And her quote was, some people do not understand how delicious it is to suffer. And I offer that because sometimes we really are probably the most alive we've ever been when we're in the heart of our suffering and right on the other side of that suffering often is bliss and healing. They walk together and they're two sides of a coin. So when we ride something all the way down to the bottom, we've nowhere left to go. And we've all basically done that. We've had this wheel of fortune that's taken us all to some of our lowest lows, but that means there's only one other place to go. And so I would say, you know, just again, we reference birth a lot here today, but the only way out is through. And I remember when I was pushing my daughter in four hours of pushing and they said, you have to push right where it hurts. 
And it's like the last thing you want to do. You just want to run away anywhere away from it, but you have to go through it. And on the other side of diving right into the heart of that suffering is bliss. So dive in and have faith that on the other side of it is ecstasy. Thank you, Ashra. Chelsea, how about you? What do you want to offer to someone who's still a little stuck in that pain? Mm. Oh gosh, whatever we said. <laughs> uh, yeah, that. And then also to remember to be compassionate with yourself because we all experience it. We all have pain. We all have trauma. We all have fear to work through. And yes, there is goodness on the other side. There is joy. There is bliss. There is ecstasy. But don't run away from your pain. Don't, don't fear it don't push it away. Ask it what it has to offer you. Ask it what growth it can offer you. Ask your pain, what is the lesson here? And, and be okay with sometimes not getting an answer because sometimes it feels hopeless, but there is more, there is light at the end. So trust that, listen to yourself and trust that. I love it. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm. Um, Erica, how about you? What's something you want to offer the listeners in terms of maybe just still being stuck in that pit? Yeah. Um, during this last year and a half, I have really felt like everything in our lives has been turned up to 11, um, both the pain and the pleasure. And I think that um, some of the things Asha and Chelsea said are really uh, poignant and that self-compassion and that knowledge that, you know, the, the darkest moment comes before the dawn. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and also that idea that it, it, we are turned up to 11 and that means that we are at a choice point and, um, it's hard when you're feeling stuck to believe that you have choice in the matter. And yet, uh, we always do. Thank you, Erica. Um, Lulu, you're going to wrap us up today. Okay. I'm going to wrap you up with the mantra tenderness. We all need more tenderness from ourselves to ourselves. And as a society, we all need more tenderness. Mm. Perfect, perfect way to wrap up today. Um, authors, thank you so much for what you're doing in the world and for being here today to share it with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. You, Laura. Thank you, Jen. Listeners, Thanks, please go down into the show notes because I have you hooked up with everybody's websites. Take the next step, go explore their world, see what they're up to because they are up to some awesomeness. And please make sure to join us on September 8th at 10 a.m. Eastern for our live stream book launch party. We're going to have all of our authors there to share their wisdom and inspiration. And we're going to have some prize giveaways for our book purchasers that day. Um, one of the special benefits of being in this community um, is a free Facebook group run by Jen Piseno. It's called Mystic Circle. So you can come on, come on into that Facebook group and rub elbows with these amazing people, continue the conversation. If you heard something today, you've got a question, you just wanna keep talking about it. Um, really, really amazing place to go and talk sacred medicine. And hey, if you're listening to this after September 8th, that means you gotta get to Amazon because the book is ready and you can grab your copy and that, will be an amazing day. So lastly today, everybody, please remember your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. What if the thing you're still a little afraid to share is exactly what someone needs to hear to change or even save their life? It is time to be brave. See you next time, everybody. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>